Uh, kia ora, kia ora ana. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and whoever is joining us right here on this feed. Great to have you on board. This is Moments That Matter, brought to you by the Waitakere Ethnic Board uh, with the great support of Foundation North, the Oturo Academy, uh, and, uh, of course, you joining us here live as we get underway. This particular session is really brought to uh, brought to bear because of the challenges that we've experienced over the course of this year through COVID. It's uh, been certainly a challenging year, and uh, the challenges don't stop um, just because we've got towards the end of November. Um, I should introduce myself. My name is Greg Ward, and it's my absolute uh, pleasure to be here with you as we get underway with this. Um, so uh, a little bit about myself. I'm an immigrant myself uh, from England, came out uh, here to New Zealand when I was three years old. And of course, uh, uh, at that time in the 1970s, uh, it was a bit of a challenge uh, if you came into this country with a very broad North Yorkshire accent. Uh, and uh, that uh, certainly had its uh, foibles and some of the challenges we had as uh, kids and as a family growing up in a very small country town. Um, uh, there are obviously challenges from the migrant and ethnic communities that we have and are supporting. And that's the whole reason for this, uh, as we go from uh, Waitakere all the way to the far north and uh, further afield as well. We want to be able to support people in many different ways. And we're talking around wellness, resilience, vulnerability, mental health, and anything that we can do, basically, to help people in this time. We want this to be a two-way conversation, so feel free, if you're joining us here on the webinar, feel free to jump into the chat, uh, feel free to jump into the Q&A. If you are watching this on the uh, Facebook Live, which you'll find on the Waitakere Ethnic Board, and also on Greg Ward's speaker, uh, then uh, feel free to make comments there as well, and uh, I'll endeavour to be like an octopus with my arms going through from device to device, uh, making sure that I can actually catch up with people as we go. So we think to ourselves and say, what is this about? It's really about the sharing of ideas. And I think that's a really important part for us, right? Like we want to share ideas. Ideas are the bedrock of being able to uh, create a better community and a better world. And I love the way that uh, George Bernard Shaw says this, if you have an apple and I have an apple and I give you my apple and you give me your apple, we simply still only have one apple each. But if I have an idea, and I give you my idea, and you give me your idea. We now have two ideas each. That's the beauty and the power of ideas, and we're then able to share and continue on as we go. So that's what we want to do. We were sharing ideas, and we have a wonderful range of speakers who have been joining us over the course of these sessions. Coming up very shortly indeed, we have the wonderful Natalie Cutler-Welsh, and she is uh, the founder of Up Your Brave. Uh, she's a coach, she's a mentor, she's a networking guru. Uh, she's also a wellness practitioner, and she'll be talking to us specifically about some of the things that we can do to help us as we move through these COVID times. And I'm looking forward to very much to welcoming her here into the studio. So let's get that directly underway. Natalie, wonderful to have you here. Hey, Greg, thank you so much. Now, uh, the great thing is, of course, so Natalie and I know each other through the Professional Speakers Association of New Zealand, and uh, uh, we've spent uh, uh, quite a lot of time bouncing backwards and forwards about the uh, about the challenges we have uh, from a wellness perspective and a mental health perspective. Nat. Um, what's um, what's your view of this year so far? How's it been for you? Well, for me, it's been um, dialed things up, really. When it, when everything happened, I was like, oh, my goodness, maybe this is my time, not necessarily to shine, but to step up because I help people in the health and wellness space. But I'm also a visibility and confidence coach for speakers and business owners. And a lot of speakers and business owners had a big change, right? For some of them, everything disappeared. For others, it was, how do I pivot? How do I navigate in this new terrain? And so for me, rather than it being quieter, it actually was busier than usual. Yeah, I completely agree with you um, on that. Uh, we've certainly had some uh, significant challenges all the way around. Uh, and we, the services that we provide or that we can offer from a wellness perspective are very much in demand uh, at the moment. And I don't see that changing between now and uh, the next kind of year, year and a half. Uh, and I think even as we hit this period of time, and Christmas being one of the more stressful periods of time in the year, uh, where people are off work, uh, they're with families, um, although we've spent a lot of time with family uh, over the course of this year. And uh, how's that been for you? 
Well, um, so I've got kids in the, in the, I'm, we're in the honeymoon stage. They're nine, 12 and 14. So they're not, re- they're not missing partying and they're not re- super duper reliant on us every waking moment. So that was good. My parents, however, live in Wellington and that was hard to not see them for those, um, those few months, of course. Um, but we have been able to see them since my husband, he is originally actually from the UK, grew up in Australia. His parents are in Australia. So we haven't seen them in a whole year. And that has definitely been quite sad. I really am keen for him to connect with them as soon as possible. So let's um, talk about um, you for the moment uh, now. Um, so you are Canadian, correct? I like to call myself you- a, a Canadian Kiwi. <laughs> a Canadian Kiwi. So, uh, so you, uh, I understand, your, is that right? Your parents are uh, Kiwi? Yeah. So my parents were born in New Zealand. And when they got married, after my dad went to med school, um, they were going to Canada for five years for him to train as an orthopedic mm-hmm. surgeon. They stayed for 35 years. And while they were there, they had three daughters. I'm the middle child. So I grew up in Canada. I'm genetically 100% Kiwi. And when I was 23, I moved to New Zealand. And uh, that's the short version. So what was your immediate, um, uh, growing with, with, with Kiwi parents is, is different, I suppose, but um, what was your immediate uh, difference points when you arrived in New Zealand between Canada and uh, New Zealand? Well, obviously size, but everyone says New Zealand is like British Columbia thrown in the dryer, right? So you take all the, the mountains and the rivers and the beaches and everything's just shrunk down. So it's drivable. Mm. Um, I guess for me, it, it not so much straight away, I moved into the outdoor space. I was an outdoors instructor, personal development. That's my, my area that I came for. But as I moved into the business world, certainly what I saw was people afraid to put themselves out there, people not wanting to be pushy. And so that is how I became almost you know, a confidence and visibility coach to help people to really up their brave and, and put themselves out there and let themselves shine. And most of the people that I keep meeting and that I work with and my friends are like the United Nations. We're from all over the place. Which is cool, right? So, I mean, I I know this as an immigrant is that we we tend to be a little bit more open culturally uh, to be able to, uh, you know, know, take on other people's experiences and and have an element of integration, which certainly I think helps uh, in from a societal standpoint. Uh, And I'm sure that you've seen this as you've traveled uh, around New Zealand and further afield. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think um, so many people have traveled, but when you were born somewhere else, the way I like to say, it, you know, born somewhere else, it's a, it's a different energy when you're having to start again, you're having to start over, depending on whatever age you came. And so for those people, we have a commonality. I mean, some people were moved to a new location because they were fleeing or getting away from something. Other people went for adventure, like myself. I went to rediscover my heritage. I ended up falling in love, not only with the country, of course, but with my future husband. And so that's a different experience than someone that was leaving a traumatic scenario and then trying to integrate into a world that was just so different, especially when you throw language on top. So for me, I would say I had all the positives of it, um, but I think we do have a mutual connection. Everyone that's had to start again and move to a new country, there's a synergy, there's a connection there. I absolutely hear you, and certainly the backstory has uh, a big impact on how you operate or how you you transition into your new country as well. Um, and certainly, some uh, quite a number of people have had uh, pretty tra- uh, traumatic challenges in terms of coming into um, these uh, uh, to New Zealand, particularly. Um, I mean, I was reminded uh, last week, and I spoke about this as well, is that I, I had a short period of time working in a factory in uh, Mangari. And while I was in, in the factory, I was working on a factory line with uh, a, a chap by the name of uh, Singh and Sao Wolfgram and another chap, uh, Fee Tran. And uh, Fee was a, oh, sorry, Tran was a, uh, uh, a boat person from Vietnam um, who had come out here, you know, and had to endure some, some significant um, horrifying circumstances to actually end up uh, in New Zealand at the age of 14. Uh, and it was fascinating. And I keep saying, I want to catch up with these three people. Mm. It was a, it was a microcosm of New Zealand, you know, multi, multiple different cultures, all working for a same goal and same purpose, but with wildly different backstories. And that's the beauty that we have so much wonderful opportunity to share our experiences and our knowledge and culture for the benefit of our own communities um, to do this cross-culturalization. 
Now, I know that you have a, uh, a presentation that, um, prepared that we were looking at doing, um, and uh, seeing as, as we are now in the Zoom environment, I've just enabled sharing in there as well. So I'm wondering if there is an opportunity for us to uh, look at, at uh, doing that. Yeah, I can do. It's coming up and saying starting screen share will stop the other computer sound. Do you want to continue? Otherwise, I can record it separately and I can provide it afterwards if we want to keep chatting. It depends on the time and the tech. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we, are we saying that if you, if you share it, then my, my sound will um, will stop, right? Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Excellent. Um, then, yes, no, that's fine. That's fine. Let's give that a go uh, because I think that we should be okay. Uh, I'm sharing computer sound at the moment. I'm going to stop my share of computer sound. There you go. Now you should be able to be fine to uh, start up. Okay, let's do it. Let's see what happens. And you probably still have me talking as well. Yep, cool. I'll stop talking now so that you can present. Let's try that. We'll go for this. It's just great. It's just really showing my Zoom screen. Can you guys see my presentation on there? Yes. So when oh, you, you do that, yep, it turns Oh, up. brilliant. Okay, great. So if you guys can see it, that's good. Okay, let's see if it clicks through. Here we go. Can you see, am I wearing the Courage jacket now? Yes, you are. Okay, brilliant. Okay, you guys, I'm going to dive straight in. Thank you so much for your patience today. It's been an interesting one. Um, okay, so as mentioned, Canadian Kiwi, this is a little bit about me. Um, parenting author, uh, podcast host, doTERRA diamond wellness advocate, mother of three, international speaker, impact entrepreneur, entrepreneur, confidence and visibility coach, and as I already mentioned, middle child. So one of the things that really came to fruition for me after, in amidst COVID is re the realization that I'm on a mission to massively raise the state of resilience, health and happiness here in New Zealand, but also on a global scale. And, um, and part of that is conversations like this. It's talking to people, but it's also taking empowered actions. And of course, my life journey has been part of that. And like I mentioned, my life journey being coming from a place of fortune, meaning like good times, and, but wanting to feel like, who am I not to help and change the world and do what I can. But the first thing we want to think about when we're looking at the four H's, what I'm talking about today, the four H's for success and happiness is number one, what does success and happiness look like to you? Like, what does it actually look like? And this is something you can take time and you can dive into that later. But if you have a pen and paper, write something down. Or if you're more of like a movie in your mind type person, what scenes can you bring to mind when I say success and happiness or fulfillment? That's a better word, maybe. What does that look like to you? What does it feel like to you? So on the left-hand side, you guys can see, this is a technique I love. I love to see visuals, movie in my mind. And I see like, where am I? Who am I with? What am I wearing? Who am I talking to? What am I saying? What does success and happiness and fulfillment look like to me? Maybe you're a list person, you can write it down. Maybe you're a mind mapper, draw a map, do a vision board, do it on Pinterest. Um, what do you want to do, be, and have? So this is really important to start thinking about before we go into these four H's, what does success and happiness look like to me? I chose this picture. Like I said, my, my crew were like the United Nations. Uh, it visually, maybe not, but when everyone starts talking, you can hear the different accents. And um, for me, it's being surrounded by people that want to change the world for good, like I do as well. So there's my question. What would you do, be, and have? What does success look like to you? So the first H I'm gonna dive into is called headspace, in other words, mindset. And the big question I wanna ask people is what are you feeding yourself? And I mean like social media consumption. I also mean, what are you eating? Because sometimes if you're eating a lot of numbers and chemicals and things in the food you're choosing, it can affect your mindset and your headspace as well. How do you talk to yourself? What are the words, not only that come out of your mouth, that, but that spin around in your head and how do you treat yourself? So these are all part of the headspace. Who are you spending time with? Are you making empowered choices about the people you're allowing to come into your, your space? I know that with COVID, I think, you know, a lot of people were more conscious about where they put their money. Also, I think where they put their time and their energy. And that's a great thing. That's a great thing to come out of COVID, I believe. We're being more aware and more intentional. So at night, I sometimes do this activity with my son, who's nine. We play what went well. And this activity is so good. You can do it on your own. I do it by myself lying in bed. I'll go, okay, Nat, what went well today? And I'll bring to mind the scenes or the conversations 
that I had that were good. Because as humans, it's so easy for us to concentrate on what didn't go well and then to berate ourselves for that. And that is not going to be serving you. That's not heading you towards where you want to go. Um, and so this is one of my favorite phrases here. Of course, I care what other people think, what others think, but I care what I think more. And I'm encouraging my children and my clients and just anybody to adopt this, this philosophy. And while we do live in a world where kindness is crucial, and that message has come through a lot lately, I also think we still need to not lose sight of what we think of ourselves and what our opinions are. Because if all we do is worry about what other people think of us, we will never have the courage to speak up or to stand for what we truly believe in. This is coming from me, of course, self-confessed extroverted Canadian. For the emotional wellness side of the headspace, definitely I'm a huge advocate for essential oils. And I've just labeled, I've just named three here that are really helpful for me. I do a lot of work on the computer. So I'm like this a lot of the time. Past tense, putting tension into the past can also help with your shoulders and your muscles. Magnolia, the oil of compassion for people that are quite ju judgmental, either of themselves pointing fingers or other people pointing fingers. Magnolia can help you just to, to be kind to yourself and others and adaptive, helping us to adapt to times of change and transition. So for me, this is an integral part of H number one, which is headspace. H number two is heart. And you need to have all four, I believe, to move you towards the success and happiness that you want. Your heart is your why. Your heart is why you're doing it in the first place. This is my family. This is us in the beach last year. Here we are facing forward. And knowing why you're doing what you're doing and being connected to that is so crucial. This is the wider why for me. This is my wider family, my parents running on the beach there with their 10 grandchildren. Uh, I don't think everyone made it in the photo, but with their 10 grandchildren. And for me, obviously it's hard. My sister lives in America. We haven't seen her in, in a, a year and a half, maybe more. Um, and these are the challenges that come when you have moved to a new country. Um, she ended up, she's Canadian as well. She ended up um, moving to America. And my other sister lives in New Zealand as well. Your why is also the people you choose to work with. And I work a lot with business owners and entrepreneurs and I tell them you are the CEO, yes, of your business, but also of your own life. So the people you choose to work with are so important. So don't just work with anybody and everyone. Don't just collaborate with anybody and everybody. It's so important that you have someone that is aligned with your goal and your vibe and your tribe. I work with impact driven speakers and solo entrepreneurs. Um, who are ready to amplify their impact so they can change the world for good. So for me, that's like a value is if somebody doesn't want to change the world for good, they're probably not my person. So I think that it's, it's so good to be clear on who you want to work with. The third H, and I'm whizzing through them because I'm just, I know that we're, uh, we're a little bit short on time. The third H is health. Obviously, if we want to have success and happiness, but we constantly are sick or we're constantly um, you know, in pain and agony, it's hard to feel positive and happy when you're in pain. So asking ourselves the question, how do I want to feel? And then what can I do to move towards that feeling? What can I do in my life? What do I want to do? What do I want to ditch maybe? And what do I want to delegate to other people? That's a way to move forward with your health as well. How do I not want to feel? Sometimes people don't know how they want to feel. They're so overwhelmed or that's, it's just really a hard question to answer. Maybe asking, how do I not want to feel? So when my kids were little, when I was in the early stages of parenting, and this is when I started writing my book called If Only They Told Me, I found it harder than I thought I would. Now, of course, I didn't have a, my mom in town. I didn't have my, my in-law in town either. They live in Australia, although they are born in the UK. And I felt like I had to do everything myself. And I really was in that, that kind of mode of like, why don't I have more time? And why isn't my husband home earlier from work? And so the picture on the left is that era of my life. And the picture on the right is the same boy, actually. This picture was taken just last week, now that he's nine. And I'm such a different person because I made the decision to not point the fingers at what, or what I don't have and instead focus on what I do have. And again, that is part of the headspace. And then when you're not trying to do everything yourself, your health also will fall into place better as well. So we're going to be looking also at health, the habits and the daily rituals. So I, what I want to talk about is staying in the want zone instead of the should zone. So Greg, you can still hear me okay? Your thumbs up. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we want to make sure I was in the show. I got zone. you loud and clear there, uh, Annette. Uh, thanks. I've just pulled focus as well, but um, I'm loving this. I mean, the uh, the elements that you're showing us here are absolutely so simple yet really profound. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm loving it. I'm sure oh, it is as well. Thank you. I mean, these are things we know, right? Intellectually, we're thinking, yeah, yeah, headset, headspace, yeah, yeah, health. But are you actually doing it? Like, are you actually? And don't try to do all four. At the end, I'm going to ask you to focus on just one, the one that's going to change things the most for you. But for some people, it's that mindset, like the talk, negative talk in their head. For me, it was a big change, game changer was getting out of what I call the should zone, where it's like, oh, poor me, I need to do this and I should do that. And I need everything was driven by what everyone else needed from me. And now I moved myself towards past the frustration zone and into what I call the impact zone, where I'm actually doing what I want, empowered choices, intentional actions, and I'm having, able to have a bigger impact, which is really what I'm craving because I'm not stuck in the should zone and busy with busyness. So staying in the want zone, not the should zone, ditching the guilt and blame. I'm a big believer in ditching the words just need and should from your vocabulary altogether. And just doing that simple little tactic is a game changer. And also being aware, of course, of what goes in and on your body is a natural part of health as well. What we're eating, creams that we're using, shampoos, whatever. So all of this is, is, is really crucial part of the health side. The last H, and this isn't just for business people, this is for everybody, is hustle. And those of us that have moved from another, another country and we've started again, right? Um, we know that sometimes you have to like make things happen. You have to find a job. You need to pay the rent. Not that people who haven't moved countries don't experience those things, but I think, um, hustle is not just a business term is what I'm saying. So what we'll need to do is you do need to, these three things, up your brave, say what you want and make it happen. These are my three crucial takeaways for really moving towards your success and happiness. And the hustle side of it doesn't have to be selling or promoting. It's just actually when you need to pour a bunch of energy into the right place in your life to make things happen. And so Up Your Brave talks about resilience and courage and pushing past the pushback, thinking, okay, of course I'm nervous about what other people are gonna say or what other people are gonna think, but I'm just gonna push past that. Yeah, I'm just gonna push past to move to where I wanna go. Saying what you want, putting your intentions out there, your goals, whether you say it to the universe or you say it in the, you know, to your, the person, your spiritual connection, or whether you say it to your partner, or whether you just write it in a journal, getting super clear on what you actually want to achieve, how you want to feel, who you want to be, how you want to show up, that is really important. And of course, then taking those intentional actions to make it happen. So part of the hustle is having a plan. You know, I, I always go like this when I talk to people, having, knowing what your intention is, having a plan and moving towards it. It's not a to-do list. It's not a to-do list. It's having a plan and taking empowered choices and intentional actions to move towards doing what you want. And sometimes we get so busy and I'll even do it. I'll go, hang on a second, hang on that. Well, what is your actual goal today? What are you trying to achieve? Oh, that's right. Okay. And then I'll, I'll get back on track. So we have to constantly re-navigate. And as a visibility coach, one of the things I do, I help people be seen and heard on a bigger level. In fact, one of my clients is going on TV today, which is so exciting, but, and I love going on TV, you know, but here's what I say. I don't want to be famous. I just want to change the world. And so there's a big difference between wanting to be on in magazines versus wanting to have a massive positive impact. And so I really want it. That's what I want. But I want everyone who's listening to think, well, what do you want? Like, what do you, you might not want that at all. That's totally cool. But do you know what you want? And are you clear on it? And have you told someone about what you want? Now, I love talking about personality types. I'm not going to dive in too deep here, but I just wanted to remind people, if your personality is more of an amiable or more of an analytic, so amiable, wanting to put other people first all the time, analytic, needing to think about things, maybe a bit of a perfectionism coming into play. Sometimes you're going to have to call on your driver. I don't mean call, but I mean like bring it on and call on your driver to get things done. Because if you're going to want, that's the hustle. Sometimes you've got it in you. You've got all these four characteristics in you. Sometimes you need to call on your driver to get things done. So here is a very short overview from what I just covered. <laughs> Number one, get clear on what success and happiness looks like to you. And what is it going to feel like when you get there? Do that activity where you see the movie in your mind. 
or a vision board or a list, whatever rocks your boat. The first H is head, headspace, mindset. The second H is heart. It's your why. Why are you doing it? What are you trying to achieve? The third one is H. How do you want to feel? And finally, hustle, empowered actions. And my question for anyone here who's watching live or watching later, which of the four H's would make the biggest difference for you if you focused on it? Go ahead. If, you're up, if you want to up your brave and comment in the chat box, let us know which of the four H's. Is it, is it the hustle? Is it like actually taking action, not just talking about it, but, but making things happen? Is it health? Is it you going, you know what? I really have been meaning to sort out my fitness or to sort out my, what am I eating? Now's the time, right? Or is it your headspace? Is it that you're going to change the dialogue? You're going to ditch the words just need and should from your vocab. What is it that's going to move you towards happiness and success? All right, there you go. <laughs> Short and sweet. I'm going to stop the screen share. Stunning. Oh, um, and you can follow me on these places. <laughs> Absolutely. As you can see just there on screen right now, just leave that up for a second there, uh, Natalie, as well, uh, just so that people can see uh, the uh, connection points there, because that's a, a really big part of this series as well, right? It's it's actually, um, we want connections, we want people to make connections. And if there's anything that you see here uh, across this uh, six part series that can help you and support you or support your communities or your 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 families or, your, or whatever uh, region you're in, feel free to get in touch. I mean, that's re a really big um, part of what we're doing is we want to share this information. Um, and, uh, and Natalie is jam packed with information and, and tools and techniques and, and just ways of being able to uh, modify your world as well. Natalie, thank you so much, mate. Absolutely. No, brilliant. no problem. I'm glad that you mentioned that as well, because I am known as the go to girl. People often will not know my real name, but they'll know that I'm the go to girl because connecting people with other people they just need to meet is my superpower. And I do because I've been here half my life, I know well over whatever, 3000 people. So definitely reach out. People often say to me, hey, Nat, do you know someone who dot, dot, dot? And I say, yes, I do. And let me connect you. So yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Connections are crucial. Yeah, they are. They are. And uh, I think one of the uh, other aspects is that the whole reason that we are doing this right now is down to you um, and your connection uh, ability. Because uh, you and uh, so it enabled myself and Shalish Bagwe uh, to connect, right. and Shalish connected um, with Baljit at the uh, Waitakere Ethnic Board, and and it was the the catalyst to enable this process to happen. So, the, that's the beauty of your uh, superpower, which is the ability to to connect and to um, have these things happening. This none of this would would have would be happening here in this shape. Um, without you well that is so exciting to hear that makes that warms my heart i love to help the people who help the people because if i'm going to amplify my impact i don't want to do it by myself i learned that lesson ages ago so if i can help you to connect with shylash and then this happens that is magic and that's what i'm talking about love it yeah we love this connection just the the possibilities are endless um, if you open your uh, yourself up and your heart up to being able to connect with other people and and seeing where that journey might take you. Um, so uh, we have an opportunity here if uh, anybody has any questions, whether it's on the uh, Facebook feed, uh, which we have open uh, right now. It's on my Greg Ward speaker page and it's also on the Waitakere Ethnic Board page two and also obviously here in the uh, Zoom uh, webinar. So feel free if you've got any questions to fire them through to uh, Natalie. Um, but I might just um, uh, pose a start of a 10 here Nats and we're just thinking about some of the questions that we were posed right at the beginning of the webinar series about some of those challenges that we have and, and they are some of them are, are quite challenging to answer I mean particularly around the issues that COVID raised for us um, right through the lockdown period where we were isolated from family we were unable to connect with people in some certain circumstances unable to connect with those people who were passing and you know the challenges that, that goes with that is 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 very large uh, and looms large and continues to be so and um, what's some of your thoughts or your uh, observations of how to navigate these challenging family situations where we feel unable to uh, give the support that we need to in these times. 
Yeah, I mean, I can definitely relate. My husband's grandfather had his 100th birthday coming up this January, and he passed away during the first lockdown. He's in Australia. So we weren't able to go, obviously, but we did attend on virtual, which was really quite interesting. It's quite a fascinating experience because you're there, but you're not. Um, so that, you know, but I think that for a lot of people with the family piece, especially if they're accustomed to having their family around, it is a big shift, not just with helping with the kids, but just being able to just suddenly you can't connect with them. Now, myself and my husband, we've never, I haven't lived in the same city as my parents since I was 19 or even any of my siblings. Um, so I'm not used to having them in my daily life. Although my sister lives in Tauranga, my parents live in Wellington. We see each other every few months, I would say. So for us, it's been, and my sister lives in America. So for us, it's been different, but not a massive change. It's the families that are used to seeing each other on a weekly, fortnightly kind of occasions and reliant to a certain extent on either care for the elderly or help for the young parents. That's the big shift. And um, I think it's, it's time for people to reach out to friends and family and say, and these are the magic words that I've taught <laughs> that my husband says to me ever since the kids were little. And he says it when he walks through the door and I just teach everyone, anyone and everyone to try to incorporate this. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? Are five magic words. It's a magic statement. And if you say that to people and you say, you know, and they will say, you know, can you just stir the pasta or can you hold the baby? Or you know what, can you pick up <laughs> some bread at the dairy for me? But what can you, what, what can I do to help is just a magic phrase. And if we all said that to each other more, but also you have to, you have to answer it. You can't just say, I'm fine, nothing. <laughs> You're not allowed to say that you have to give an actual thing. And so just like when my babies were little and I had a list on the fridge, you know, that people could do for me, little, make a list on your fridge. If someone says to you, what can I do to help? You need to have an answer. You cannot say you're fine because everyone can do with a little bit of help. I, I'm glad that you said that the, the second part of that, because that's one of the biggest issues that we have uh, individually is the ability to actually accept the help uh, when somebody uh, offers. But by the same token, the person offering has to actually be making a genuine offer because it's very easy to walk into somebody's chaotic situation and go, oh, what can I do? Uh, and it's an interesting little situation. And, and when our kids were very, very young, just tiny little babies uh, and they're as twins, uh, which is a, a lot of work uh, for, um, for anyone, particularly for my wife, um, we had a family member come around who said, um, uh, oh, what can I do to help? And so uh, we said, well, actually, the, uh, the, the toilet could do with a clean, the bathroom could do with a clean. Um, <laughs> and they never came back. The response was, oh, I don't, I don't think I'll do that. <laughs> and well, it's got to... <laughs> that's why I give people a this or that. So when I teach, my, when I coach my clients in business, I set, tell them to give people a this or that offer in business. Same thing. When you're asking and someone says, what can they do to help? Give them a this or that. So don't just say, can you clean the toilet? You would say, um, sure, that would be amazing. Um, do you want to clean the toilet or do you want to go pick up some milk and bread from the dairy? They'll be like out the door to the dairy, like straight away. <laughs> this or that offer. It's a really good uh, concept. It's a really good concept, not only just for, for social situations and for in this, you know, the, in terms of helping out, but it's actually exactly a business aspect to that as well, isn't there? By giving people options, it, it makes them actually have to make a choice. As opposed but to not too many no. options, not too mm. many options. They'll do yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah. um, what would you say to those, um, those people who are seeing changes in relationship due to the proximity of family? And we know that we've been working pretty hard in our own spaces and the social structure in our own families and uh, uh, you know, outside the workplace has changed significantly. Um, what have you seen and what, what's some of your advice um, around that from a, uh, a health perspective? Well, a big one that I've seen in my world is women entrepreneurs who work from home who suddenly have their husband in their space. <laughs> That's a game changer. And so having kind of clarity around your area of where you're working, we actually created, we actually built a wall, literally, um, on just before the very first lockdown, my husband went and got some jib and he turned what was like a non-room into a really small office for himself, uh, which was amazing. It meant that we could both work from home. We both talk a lot for our jobs. And it meant we could, we knew he had our space. We weren't, I couldn't hear him while he was talking and vice versa. 
but in terms of health, yeah, definitely people want to be aware of, on one hand, we're not mixing and mingling with so many people. So we're actually, we've been, you know, generally as a society, um, not catching so many things to a certain extent because we're so much more cautious now of where we touch door handles and, and it's just, just a different level of awareness altogether. But in terms of mental health as well, making sure obviously that if you're not a people person, I'm a people person, I don't need a lot of time um, to myself. Uh, however, my husband is a complete introvert. And so he will, he loves running. He loves swimming. And those are so crucial for his own happiness and his own mental health as well. I concur with him. Uh, one of the things for me has been uh, maintaining a set of uh, strategies, I suppose, that work for my own mental health. And uh, one, one of those is very much uh, exercise because there's the, the elements of exercise are myriad, right? So it, it's not just about the fact of getting out and doing some physical activity. It's the process of actually doing that as well. So it's the, it's the process of actually setting a goal of getting up early to be able to go off. I, I like running in the morning. So I've got to set a goal of getting up early and then I've got to achieve that goal. And sometimes it feels insurmountable because of the pressures of work and the, and, the, and the challenges that go with it. But what I do is break it down to mini goals, tiny, tiny micro goals of maybe just open my eyes or just put a leg out of the bed, put, just put one shoe on. That's all you gotta do, just put one shoe on. And of course, you, you, it's essentially a way of tricking yourself into getting these things done. But having strategies and knowing what they are, understanding yourself and going, okay, I need to do this and being pretty, uh, strict about it on yourself as well because it's quite easy to let one slide and then another slide and then of course we're back to square one uh feeling as in, in a position where we don't want to be um so i i completely concur with you uh, on that and that brings together three of those whys the, the h's sorry that we talked about because it's the headspace you have to tell yourself but also the why you're like hang on a second why am i doing this run oh that's right because it helps me to be a better dad, to, to have more energy, to stay healthy. And so as long as you know why you do something, then you are actually doing what you want. You might not want to go running in that moment, but if you connect the, that moment with your actual why you're doing it, then you can get yourself out the door. And like you said, micro goals, love that. Cool. Uh, what about those families who are currently in, I would say with the change, we have changing circumstances and, and not everybody can put up a wall. Uh, within their uh, uh, spaces, Don't, not everybody has the resources to be able to achieve that. Um, what can we do to be able to understand somebody else's point of view a little better and uh, uh, rather than probably doing the same old, same old of um, escalation? So one of my other favorite phrases is, um, what do you want? So in my house, what we do, and I've, I had a friend come up to me the other day, Nat, I used your tip about, and it's, it's a, it saved my marriage. I'm like, yeah, I know it's so good, right? You say, what do you want? So if, so let's say um, you're, you and your partner are just getting on each other's nerves, you're in each other's faces and, it, and they're going, oh, you, like, here's an example. I said to Matt, this is a while ago, you know, oh, so babe, what time are you getting back from your swim? You run, like, are you going to be, what time are you going to be back? And he's like, what do you want? I said, I want to go to Pilates at seven. He's like, I'll be back at 6.45. Yeah. But I was so busy going, hey, babe, like, are you swimming? Are you running? So like, what's your plan? And, and I didn't really care if he was swimming or running or what his plan was. I just wanted to go to Pilates. So now in our family, we have this culture where we literally go, what do you want? Like, and it's not offensive. It's not rude. It's just, just cut through the mumbo jumbo. What do you actually want? And so it's so helpful with the kids as well. They're nine, 12 and 14, schoolwork, activities. And sometimes they're like, oh, can you drive me? Should I take the bus? It's like, what do you want? I would love you to drive me. I really don't want to take the bus today. Sweet. So we're not always going to say yes, but at least we can cut to the chase of what the person actually wants. And what do you want? The same as, you know, what, how can I help? What can I do to help? But what do you want is a game changer in your workplace, in your marriage, in your family. Try it out. I love that. I, and it was quite synonymous with an experience that I had, I, I trained as an actor and continue to do so. And I do a lot of improvisation. And I was down in Christchurch with a, an instructor from Philadelphia, um, who is, uh, sorry, from Portland in the US. And she had a really wonderful way of being able to support people in a scene. And, I'm, and although we're talking about an acting environment, this is actually really valuable in terms of your own life and, and talk to exactly what you're talking about which is you have two people in a scene and you start the scene and there's tension 
whereas that's you know, when we do it as a act as a, acting as a performance you need tension you've got to have tension in, in a scene for it to be watchable uh, but tension in real life is not necessarily what we want however in the scene there's a lot left unsaid and we don't tend to say these kind of things you just build up this sort of energy that goes on till the point where one person will turn to the other and say what's this really about which opens up a floodgate you have to be prepared at that point to actually uh, take that on board um, and there's another little technique that i came across which was when you're talking to teenagers and teenagers are notoriously challenging to be able to get information out of and often we'll get home from school and they'll, they'll come into the house and you'll say to them, oh, oh, cool, what happened today? What was, the, what was the greatest things that happened today? What was the best thing that happened to you today? Uh, which doesn't elicit a great deal of response. But if you ask them, what was the worst thing that happened to you today? It opens up a floodgate and you have to be prepared to listen. You actually, and mean it, that you actually want to listen because that's the thing that people want to tell you the challenges and yes the high points but we tend to be the human brain is five times more negative because of the nature of the hind brain we have to look out for danger so we're constantly looking around what are the danger points what are the danger points uh, but by doing that you can open that up and then move to what was your successes that's right i love that and sometimes with my kids if they don't talk to me they'll they'll text me like in this actual same house they'll send me a a message on the text so interesting time for tech <laughs> technology everywhere Absolutely. Um, well, I've been uh, watching through on the uh, webinar chat and I've been having a look on the Facebook page and uh, I can't see any questions at this particular point in time. But if there are any questions or if anybody wants to make any comments, feel free to fire something in there. Uh, uh, and uh, otherwise, we'll be wrapping up in a relatively short amount of time uh, because it's been just wonderful to um, have Natalie here. And Natalie has an incredible depth of knowledge and a depth of experience as well and and having it here in this capacity is only touching on a very very small part of uh, uh, her experience and knowledge and acumen um so um that's for uh for you what's happening right now what's uh, what's your focus and what's your um, sort of next next things well for me you know with COVID happening it was the two my two worlds colliding so my uh I've got a little prop here you know, I, I've got these kind of, I call them the Olympic rings of my life of how these different worlds that I work in. But when COVID happened, I was like, wow, this is interesting. My health, the, so I help people with their health and wellness with essential oils. All of a sudden, everyone was way more health conscious. And then on the other hand, businesses suddenly had to pivot or be more visible in an environment where they didn't know if they should be promoting themselves. And they didn't want to be pushy because you know, people don't have money and all the little um, beliefs and, and realities or non-realities that were happening. And so I found myself to become, I was already busy, but even more busy, but in a good way, because it was moving me towards the impact that I want to have. And coming back to my mission to massively raise the state of resilience, health and happiness in New Zealand and on a global scale. And if I can do that by doing my thing with health and doing my thing with business owners, but also doing my thing, like you said, connecting people, connections, collaborations, and courage. That's what we need to get through this interesting time and create an even better scenario for everybody. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I'm absolutely loving it. Um, to all of our people who are here joining us uh, online, thank you very much indeed. And for those who are watching the, uh, the stream after uh, this particular live uh, session, uh, certainly hope that you have uh, been able to take away some great tips there from Natalie. I certainly have as well. And uh, so you're looking at the elements of headspace, heart, um, health and hustle. And uh, if you go through this recording, you'll be able to find some of the uh, the pointers in there as well from Natalie Cutler Wells. So you can contact um, Natalie. Uh, just remind us on your uh, connection points there on websites and so forth. We've got nataliecutlerwelsh.com. You can spell it, good on you. Or up your, upyourbrave.com. Absolutely fantastic. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us here on Moments That Matter, the Waitakere Ethnic Board series. Uh, we look forward to, uh, I certainly look forward to catching up with you in the very near future as well. Um, but uh, I will say on behalf of yourself and of, of us here in um, the studio, 
great to have you here and joining us and uh, certainly look forward to catching up next week uh, when we have uh, the wonderful Ami Pepe and he is known as the Tony Robbins of the South Pacific. He's a speaker, he's a mindset coach uh, and uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Looking forward to having a really good chat with Ami and that's coming up next week which is the Wednesday 2nd of December at 10 a.m. as per usual. It's the fifth in our six-part series here with the Waitakere Ethnic Board, the Moments That Matter series. Once again, thank you very much indeed from Natalie Cutler-Welsh and myself. Great to have you on board. Looking forward to catching you up next week at 10 a.m. See you soon. <music>